born with sickle cell anemia. He had been told for most of his life that, well, if he's lucky, he'll make it to 18. If he's lucky, lucky, he'll make it to 20. But having children, impossible. And so there it was in his hands. And he must have reached out his index finger and I clasped it. In that moment, we had a bond, a bond that would be like no other, one that would be unbreakable. So when I was about five years old, I'd see dad come home from work, lay out a paper on the dining table and start drawing. He was an architect. And so I was just always so fascinated by the fact that he's just drawing lines, just lines. So I said, okay, it looks cool. So I also used to get my own paper, sit there and draw lines. In this way, we were forming our, one of our first meaningful bonds. And one day, I was curious to know what dad does when he's not on the dining table drawing lines. So he took me to site with him, just here in Nairobi, Chaka Place. He was one of the lead architects on that project. And when I got there, I faced one of the toughest decisions in my life. On one hand, my dad is heading this way to go and draw and talk to the clients. On this side of the room, there are samosas. <laughs> Long story short, I went for the samosas first, and then to the more serious things. But by the end of that meeting, he was not architect David Sifuma, he was Natalie's dad. Natalie, the girl who ate half the samosas then. The second time that I can say we had a meaningful bond, again, from observation, dad would wake up very early on Sunday mornings, go and wash the car, and then get ready to go to church. And like, getting wet without getting in trouble, count me in. And so now every Sunday, we'd wake up together, wash the car, and get ready and go to church. <clears throat> now much later, when I was a teenager, a diva at that, I wanted to go and hang at the mall, which is what we used to do, hang at the mall. When I look back now, I'm like, what exactly were we doing? Just walking around the mall, but anyway. So I'd ask dad for pocket money before going to hang in the mall, junction to be specific. And one time he gave me pocket money, a second time he gave me pocket money. But when it got to the third time that this girl is going to the mall to hang out, she's like, no, I can't just be giving you money, you need to earn it. I'm like, earn it? I'm 13. Okay. So he said, here's what we'll be doing. Every Friday I'll come home with all the receipts from bank statements and receipts from the week. And I'll come home also with a paper punch and a file. And what you'll do is you'll file all these receipts in chronological order, and I'll pay you 100 shillings. Small, small money. I said, OK. So we started doing that, and I got into the rhythm of it. Got my pocket money, hung out at Junction. No stress, no wahala. Those three key moments are three of so many that I shared with my dad. And when I think back now, each of those taught me something so fundamental. The first is you can just let your hands draw, release. The second was if you want to get stuff done, wake up and get stuff done. Wash the car, go to church. And the third, which for some people who know me, still stands today. I'm very organized, I'm very orderly, nothing should, you know, go out of line. But it wasn't just me that my dad had this bond with. He also had a bond with my mother, he had a bond with my brothers, he had a bond with his own siblings. And when I think about even just his hands, he did so much to make our life easy 
to make us feel comfortable. He even helped raise his own siblings. That was that guy. And again, he wasn't just architect David Sifuma, he was Natalie's dad. And that was the case for the longest time. But then 2015 came. And 2015 was a very interesting year. Remember, dad was born with sickle cell anemia. And then now 2015 comes and all of a sudden his kidneys just stop working. Strange. And I remember the doctors who would look at him would be like, how are you alive? These two very intense illnesses and you're just, you know, you're okay. Of course by then he was much weaker than what I was used to seeing. But we had to adapt. And it wasn't easy at first, but we got into the rhythm of things. And those same hands of my father's that had first held me now relied on me, on my mother and my brothers. At first it was with, you know, just simple things in the house. But eventually, because the illness started to take a toll on him, we had to help him from bed to the bathroom, from bed downstairs to the living room, to the car, from the car to the hospital for dialysis sessions, from the hospital back into the house. And it wasn't easy. Now by this time, I'd had to forego school because I was the eldest and finances were not the best. My mom was a sole caregiver, but I also started working. And just to, to release her of that burden of having to pay school fees for three children and medical bills, I decided to put school on pause. I was in my second year at, at Daystar University. And I started working. So when I didn't have a shift at work, I would be at home with dad, just making sure he was comfortable. On one of those moments, or one of those days, we'd come back home from a dialysis session and I'd just served him lunch and he was fine. But shortly after, I had to run to him with a bucket because he was nauseated. I remember he was so weak that day. And once he was done, he looked up at me and he said, I'm sorry. And I remember my heart breaking because why? I'm the one who's sorry. I was sorry because I could not reach into him and just remove that illness from him. But again, we adapted. We knew that dialysis can lead to nausea. Sometimes he was nose bleeding. But I was so grateful that in that moment or in that season of our lives, we had such supportive family. My aunties, my maternal aunties, were always available to come help us get him to the hospital. If he needed blood, they were willing. And I was so grateful for that. Whenever dad was stable, now that he was mostly confined to the house, we adopted a new routine. It involved reading a short story about twice a week. And then he and I would sit down and discuss the story, what we liked, what we didn't like, what didn't make sense. And a lot of times our views opposed. But it was our time, Nat and Nat's dad. So that became it. And then 2019 happened. And 2019 was the year before COVID, for context, but also a very challenging year for us. There were more hospital visits. Things were just tense. By this time, we also started to see an ugly side of some of the people that we knew who initially were wishing well, 
via text message or WhatsApp message, but by then they were not answering our calls. We needed blood. We needed help. At this time, I also got to see the worst in. I also got to see the worst in our health institutions. Because if you know again a thing or two about sickle cell anemia, is insurance does not want anything to do with that. Now, someone who has sickle cell and kidney disease is like, no thanks. But <clears throat> at that point, my family's resilience was being sharpened, and I know that now. And so we got by and lived on hope. Hope, that powerful thing, hope. So on the 15th of December 2019, when he suffered a stroke, I was hopeful he would get out of it, and he did. But then two days later, on a day like today, 17th December 2019, he was admitted in hospital. And I remember getting a text message from my mom saying, your dad has been admitted, which again, by this time, we're used to it. But something felt different. At that time, I was working, and I was in the Pauqua office writing a story that was due that evening. It was in the afternoon. So it was due that evening, and I started crying after I'd seen the message as I'm writing my story. And one of my colleagues looked at me, and she's like, are you crying? I'm like, yeah, but the story needs to get finished, and then I'll cry afterwards. Organized. But indeed, that admission was different, because two days later, Dad was still in hospital. Five days later, Dad was still in hospital. On Christmas Day, Dad was still in hospital. And I remember I went, and I was with my mom and her brother and two of my cousins. And he was weak, but he was just like, it's Christmas, don't be so sad. So I was like, OK, I won't be sad. So Christmas came and went, 26th came and went, and on the 27th, I bought this book, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky. And I wanted to finish it before the year ended, and then hand it to my dad so that he could read it, and then we could talk about this thing called What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky, which, by the way, it means nothing. So I'm seated at Ladnan Hospital where he is, was being dialyzed at the time, 30th December now. And a nurse comes, taps me on the shoulder and says, your dad would like to see you. So I go in and there's a seat right next to him. And again, he just wanted to hang. The guy just wanted to say hi and to hold my hand. The storyteller in me now thinks that he wanted to hold my hand because he wanted to remember what it was like 24 years before when he first held my hand. And so we had a moment, we chatted, I told him about what I was feeling, what I was reading, how I wanted him to read the same story as well. And we held hands for a long time. They were so soft. I left the hospital, as was the routine at that time, and on the 31st of December, I got a call at four in the morning from my mom, and she said, please come to the hospital. Your dad is not in the best condition. I was with a cousin at the time, and so we drove to Ladnan Hospital. And we prayed, I hoped. We were certain this was just a minor hiccup. But at 8.23, a.m. that morning, we had to put him off life support. I don't think death is ever easy. It's not linear, the feelings after. But I thought about the day before when he held my hand, and I realized that those three precious moments from when I was much younger, he was transferring a bit of himself to me through his hands. And that final time that we held hands, he was giving me the bravery, the gentleness, and the conviction to carry on 
the work that he had begun as a strong man, as a sifuma. And from then, and looking back now at what those, what this past um, three years have been like, it's not been easy. But when I think about my dad, I think about his hands. And then I look at my own hands and think about all the stories I've been able to write with these hands. I think about all the doodles I've been able to draw with these hands. I think about all the good things I've been able to do with these hands. And even the not so good things. But that's the story of me and that's dad. And I will always remember him because of his hands. Thank you.